I'm Hallie Jackson in New York with a breaking news special report. Donald Trump on trial, super close to the finish line here, with prosecutors right now taking a quick break, but rounding the corner on the final stretch of their closing argument to those 12 New Yorkers, asking them to make history, convict a former president, and Republicans pick to be the next one. I want to show you here Mr. Trump and one of the breaks we've gotten on this very long day so far. So far, six hours of closings in a case that centers around these 34 felony counts that Mr. Trump lied on business records to cover up alleged hush money payments to former adult film star Stormy Daniels for an affair that Mr. Trump denies. Now, prosecutors say this is election interference, but it's the defense who spoke first, setting up their argument in three big buckets, if you will, and the prosecution had an answer for all of it. So here's the Reader's Digest version. First, you had Trump defense attorney Todd Blanche saying, wait a second, you can't convict Donald Trump because those documents are not lies. They're legal retainers to former Trump fixer Michael Cohen. Prosecutors say, well, no, those documents are illegal, part of a literal mountain of evidence. The defense painting one picture of who Mr. Trump is, this guy who's way too busy to be part of a scheme like this. They say, after all, he was the president, the prosecution. In its response, reminding the jury this didn't just start with that 2017 meeting at the White House. This began years before with schemes to, in their words, catch and kill stories to help him get elected. So it all comes down to this guy, Michael Cohen, right here. Mr. Trump's former attorney, the star witness, the man who was in the room where it allegedly happened. The defense going after Cohen's credibility big time, calling him the MVP of liars, the gloat, the greatest liar of all time. The defense says those lies are proof the jury cannot rely on Michael Cohen, but prosecutors had a different name for him. They say they didn't pick Cohen up at the witness store. He's here because Donald Trump chose him to be his fixer, instead calling Cohen the tour guide through the physical evidence who gives the context of this case. Now, through all of this, you had this split screen moment outside court as this was happening inside, because outside you had the Biden campaign sending a very famous surrogate of sorts, Robert De Niro, in for this split screen moment. Look at this. De Niro, we're about to show you at one point, getting into it with Trump supporters. Then you had later Mr. Trump's son trying to light things up himself. We're going to get there in a second. But for the next 25 minutes, we will wrap up this trial, breaking down these closing arguments as they happen and asking now, what is next? Our team of reporters and legal and political experts are here to break it down. I want to start with Rahima Ellis, who is outside court. So real quick, Rahima, just timing wise, it is 501 Eastern right now. What's the status with courts still going on as we speak? Yeah, it is. They've taken a break. They took a break maybe about three minutes ago. It's going to be a 20 minute break. And the judge says they're going to come back because he says um, it looks like the jurors that they are still pretty alert. So it looks like this thing could go until seven o'clock this evening if it doesn't finish before then. And if it seems like it's going to take longer, the judge says he's going to make an assessment of the jurors to try and figure out if they're going to finish for the day. It seems like the judge would really like to finish these arguments in terms of the closing arguments now from the prosecution so that he can then present his charge to the jury tomorrow and this jury can get this case and begin uh, deliberating on it. They've been going so far now, Hallie, as far as the prosecution is concerned, for two hours and 45 minutes. Earlier in the day, the prosecution said it would take him anywhere from four and a half to five hours, maybe, but he said that would depend on what that closing argument was from the defense. And some of what we've been hearing from the prosecution, it is tick-tock, tick-tock in terms of line by line and email by email in his effort to show that this was not just a one-off on Michael Cohen's part because the defense made a big deal of trying to show that this thing all hinges on Michael Cohen and Michael Cohen is a liar, not someone to be believed. The prosecution is trying to restore Michael Cohen's credibility, if you will, by showing that he's not the only one who was engaged in what the prosecution is calling a conspiracy. And even at one point when they talk about that HELOC, the home equity loan that Michael uh, Cohen took out to pay $130,000, Steinglass says uh, this was written down as a real estate deal. Steinglass is saying yet another falsification of records. Again, had he filled out the form, the bank not, might, not, might not have opened this account. This wasn't a retainer. It was a payoff. Hallie? So, Rahima, the judge is saying just in the last couple of minutes here, he hopes to try to finish up closings tonight, if possible, before giving jury instructions, presumably tomorrow morning. And then, of course, it is in the hands of those 12 New Yorkers. What else stands out to you throughout the day as we look ahead to tomorrow and what is potentially the beginning of the end for this trial this week? 
This jury has got to really decide. I guess that's the case in any legal case. Who do they believe in the arguments? Which ones are most convincing? Who makes a greater and most persuasive presentation? Take a look at this in terms of what the Trump defense team said earlier today. They said they did not try to inflame your emotions. They did it to try to embarrass President Trump. And that, that is what the prosecution's case is all about. The prosecution, on the other hand, is saying through Joshua Steinglass about Stormy Daniels in particular, if her testimony were so irrelevant, why did they work so hard to discredit her? In the simplest terms, Stormy Daniels Daniels is the motive of why all of this was going on, why, why Michael Cohen had to take out that $130,000 to pay off Stormy Daniels in order to keep her quiet from telling her story, which you know was coming so close on the heels of the release of the Access Hollywood tape. And Hope Hicks herself had testified that the campaign was in somewhat of a meltdown because of this. This was very important that they had to silence Stormy Daniels, according to the prosecution. Callie? Rahima Ellis, live first there in downtown Manhattan. Rahima, thank you very much. Let me bring in some of our legal experts here. NBC News analyst Danny Savalos, Georgetown law professor Michelle Goodwin. It is good to be back with you here on this Tuesday. Uh, the gang has reassembled, if you will. Danny, let me start with you and the former president's defense, because there was this kind of catchy moment where Todd Blanche laid out what he described as a top 10 list or the top 10 reasons why there should be reasonable doubt. You see the reasons here. Uh, I think in the eyes of some legal experts, a few of these seem stronger than some others, if you will. Gimmicky, in your view, or is this what you need to keep a jury's attention during a long day? Definitely not gimmicky. Uh, lists like this, usually a little shorter in my comfort zone, but lists and bullet points, those are key. You want to really hit the jury with something they can remember when they go back there. Now, is a list of 10, and if you can throw that back up there, with those 10, some of those you probably could have consolidated. I think mm. three and four was like, no intent to defraud, uh, not much intent to defraud. I mean, I'm paraphrasing and I'm being glib here, but some of those points could have been combined, I think. Yeah. Uh, but very critical to use those kinds of things. You see the prosecution, they came out and did the exact same thing. They opened with three key points. Yep. And many folks know, the rule of threes, I don't know if it's cosmic or psychological or what it is, but there is a <laughs> general rule that things in threes are more easily memorized than an, a list of ten. But at the same time, if a juror is looking for one item to hang their hat on, ten items is arguably seven better than three, if my math is right. Well, I'm not a math major, Danny, but I think the fact check on that one is true. So, Michelle, let's talk about those sort of three reasons from the prosecutors, if you will, the rule of threes Danny was talking about, that there were false business records, number one. Number two, that those records were intended to cover up a conspiracy related to the election. And number three, that Donald Trump himself was involved. Did they do what they needed to do so far to convince a jury that those three things are accurate? They've done so in a non-rushed way mm. with a narrative, a narrative arc, and people like stories. And in this narrative arc that they've done, they have gone back through the beginning of the trial to remind jurors why they're there. They've reminded them of prior testimony, compelling prior testimony, not just what Michael Cohen brought forward, but we have also um, those who testified from the Inquirer, uh, those who testified that were part of the president's transition team and served in the White House. So this has been a very deliberate methodical work that we've seen from the prosecution side today. Let me ask you, Danny, about this so-called empty chair argument that you and I have talked about just to pull back the curtain in our office here upstairs at 30 Rock because you're interested in it. The people that were not called here, somebody like former Trump org CFO Alan Weisselberg, who could potentially be critical in putting Donald Trump right more directly tying Donald Trump to the scheme that prosecutors allege right now. It's just Michael Cohen's word for it. And the defense has been very clear what they think of Michael Cohen's word. Very little. I thought not only was this an important argument, I felt like the defense didn't make enough of that argument. Mm. I felt like they could have devoted less time to just saying Michael Cohen lies and more time to something like the absence of an Alan Weisselberg, the absence of a Keith Schiller, who was the bodyguard to Donald Trump, the absence of his sons. You see one of his sons right there, uh, their involvement. They have a tangential involvement here. None of them were called. 
I think I might have focused more on that and maybe a little less on the Michael Cohen is a liar. Don't get me wrong. I would have hit that hard. You have to because that's what you do with cooperating witnesses. Uh, the prosecution owns all their credibility issues and you have to really hammer them home that they're insurmountable. Michelle, now all the attention, right? It is in the hands That's of these right. 12 New Yorkers, these 12 people, as the defense is looking to con convince them not to convin convict Donald Trump. The prosecution is looking to get them to convict former President Trump. We're showing them to you again here, the teacher, the salesman. Interestingly, a couple of attorneys here, those are spotlighted in, among these seven men and five women who make up this jury. Could you see the ways, Michelle, that both sides were maybe trying to tailor their arguments to the jury specifically? We talked about some of the rhetorical flourishes, the top 10, the top three, et cetera. What else? That's right. Well, in trying to paint Michael Cohen and spending so much time as a person who is uh, untrustworthy, that he has no credibility, that this is a political witch hunt, is something that plays in the year of an election. So that's what the defense was trying to do, albeit they have been scrambling his defense attorneys across multiple um, investigations and multiple indictments. On the other hand, what the prosecution has tried to do is to relay that what this is is about something that nobody can be above the law with that nobody can falsify business records, and most importantly, Americans can't be duped in the time of an election, and this is what the former president was trying to do. He was trying to act fraudulently such that Americans couldn't get a fair chance at who they wanted to elect in 2016. Michelle Goodwin, Danny Savalos, thank you very much. 5-11 Eastern Time here in New York with that trial happening just... Uh several blocks, about a mile or so far, downtown in Manhattan here. We will see what happens at 7 p.m. That is the next pivot point for Judge Mershon. I want to bring in two people who know the former president well, his former attorneys, Michael Vanderveen and Bill Brennan. Good to have you both. Uh, Bill, thank you for joining us here on set. Michael, I'm sure we'll see you tomorrow. That is my hope. Bill, let me start with you. Um, would you feel confident, based on what you heard from Todd Blanche, that you got the job done if you were him today? I think he did. I mean, it's important to remember that he has to encapsulate uh, a month plus trial into uh, surely over hours. two hours, two, two hours and a half and hours. Two hours minutes, yeah. And, you know, he has to, it's a balancing test. I'm sure he's tempted to spend uh, two hours and 29 minutes on Cohen's a liar, but you have to check those boxes for the other evidence that came in. And I heard Danny say, you know, about the missing witness, which is important uh, issue. Uh, he could have hit it harder, but, you know, there's no burden shifting in a criminal case. The uh, prosecution is not supposed to be able to get up and say, well, they could have called him. But if you really hit it too much with Judge Merchan, he may give them a little uh, more than they should have. So I think Mr. Blanche did a good job at balancing uh, the equities here. But uh, in my opinion, it really does come down to Cohen. Flip side of the coin, though, two hours and 57 minutes, Michael. Was it too long? Was it too, quote, unquote, meandering, of some, as some critics have suggested? Well, you know, that really depends upon uh, e each case and what the lawyer in the courtroom is seeing. Uh, Blanche's uh, experience at giving closings, and, you know, uh, we all like to hear ourselves talk. So it's quite possible um, that uh, uh, he was reading the jury and, and figured he could keep going long. You know, it's interesting for the client to sit there and hear the closing from yeah. your defense. You, you feel great when uh, Steinglass jumps up and starts his closing. It's a completely different feeling in that courtroom. You say something funny, Michael. You say for the client to sit there and listen to the defense. It is not just any client. It is Donald Trump. It is the former president of the United States, and it is somebody mm -hmm. who really cares, who really who really gives a damn about the way that his attorneys represent him. Bill, you know this well. Michael, I know you know this well, too. Um, give us a sense of how you think Blanche did as it relates to the conversations he might be having with Mr. Trump now, right? The closings are over or about to be over here. Because I wonder how much of what you heard was Todd Blanche making a case to the jury, those 12 men and women, and how much was Todd Blanche making a case to the one defendant sitting at the table behind him? I would say that anything... Uh, said to one particular person, uh, in this case, Mr. Trump, was de minimis. Mr. Blanche is a professional. He did a spectacular job defending Mr. Trump in this case. And he did 
what Mike and I did at the impeachment and in the uh, payroll company trial before Judge Merchan. We showed the respect we would show to any client. Yeah. It's a little different when your client used to run the world for four years, but we, we did our jobs as if it was Donald Duck. It, it didn't matter. Did you uh, make anything of that moment towards the end of the defense's closing when there was a suggestion by Todd Blanche that the jury would decide whether or not to send Mr. Trump to prison? We heard Judge Mershon sort of, there was an objection raised. There will be some curing to the jury on that piece of it. That Because, you know, it's not the jury's job. They don't decide what the sentence is. Correct. The sentence could simply be a fine. We just don't know. We can't speculate at this point. But really, it's a bit of a legal fiction. On the one hand, you say, well, it's not within the province of the jury to worry about penalty. There's a charge that says, you know, uh, make your decision not to avoid an unpleasant duty or to show favorite. That's all great. Mm. Everybody sitting in that jury box knows that in a criminal case, it could result in prison time. So if he said it, it was most likely in the heat of passion, inadvertent. And to tell them that he could face prison is nothing they don't know already. Michael, to you here, because the prosecution is still going. We have heard now from Mr. Seinglass for several hours. There is a suggestion they're going to go till 7 o'clock once the jury gets back in the room, kind of see where they are and go from there. Uh, it, it is obviously the rule in this particular courtroom, um, in this court, that prosecution gets the last word, right? So the jury is left with the words of the prosecutor. Mr. Trump clearly does not like that based on his Truth Social posts. That's just the way it goes. If you're sitting at that defense table with him, are you hearing anything from the prosecution that's giving you cause to be nervous? Are you hearing anything where you're going, man, that's a good point, and we just couldn't combat it? Well, I'll tell you. First of all, Josh Steinglass is a tremendous closer. I've sat and I listened to him mm. close, so he really knows what he's doing. He had a lot of time, you know, five days to prepare this closing. And the thing about closings is, you know the case cold by the time you close. You know everything that was allowed in and you know everything that was not allowed in. And uh, that that is really crucial um, to the closing. But I think that um, sitting there, uh, the the defense is really in a position where they're just waiting, waiting for it to wrap up. You know, they know what he's gonna say. Steinglass has said everything they thought he was gonna say. And they're just waiting for this to wrap up, get the instructions, get their verdict. You say get the instructions like it's simply a box to check. I know, you, I know you know how important that is. Explain to our viewers. The jury instructions could be critical here tomorrow morning. Sure. The jury instructions are absolutely critical because they're the law. And when the judge instructs the jury, he tells them how to take the facts of this case and apply the law to them. And I know that he was very careful uh, when I closed in front of him, and he was very careful today to say, I'm the the, the guy who mm. uh, instructs the jury. I don't want you folks talking about the law. Um, I will be doing that. And it is, it's absolutely crucial because he's in a position to frame the law uh, with the facts. Um, and and it, can, it it's, a, it's a very small margin between- yeah. um, well, Mike, I'm sure guilty. you'll agree because we've discussed this this particular case, similar to our case, could rise and fall on a nuanced uh, uh, sentence in an instruction. It's not like, you know, robbery is an unlawful taking or murder. Is, this is going to be, if they find that this uh, was done, was it done for the benefit of the campaign, for the benefit of the marriage, for both, for, you know, it, it really could rise or fall on one sentence in an instruction. Is that important? Critical 24 hours? Yeah, so oh, you're absolutely right. All right, Michael Vanderveen, no, Bill Brennan. I was just going to say. Not shocking to hear both of you in agreement, I would say. Um, I appreciate you both being with us. Thank you so much. Uh, lots to discuss in this very important 48 hours, obviously, in this trial. Thank you both. I want to get to the politics now with Dasha Burns, who covers all things Trump campaign. She is live for us in downtown Manhattan. What was interesting here, Dasha, we noted it at the top of the show, this split screen moment, because as all this drama is unfolding inside of court during closing arguments, as our guests have just talked through, outside court, you had the Biden campaign getting more aggressive than we've seen them, really this whole trial, bringing yeah. out this idea of these sur this sort of high profile surrogates, Robert De Niro, former uh, Capitol Police officer, current Harry Dunn, who was running for Congress uh, unsuccessfully. Um, and I should note here, too, I'm being told by our team, the court is now back in session. So we'll look from notes from inside the room. But, Dasha, talk us through that piece of it here, um, how you see the politics of it. 
Well, look, the Biden campaign, according to reporting from our colleagues Mike Memoli, Monica Alba, and Natasha Karecki, they have felt handcuffed by this trial. It has sucked up so much of the oxygen, and we know that they have been planning to get more aggressive after the trial. Of course, the trial is not over, but this was a big media moment that they tried to take advantage of to set up that contrast, making the argument via Robert De Niro and uh, some Capitol Police officers that were there on January 6th that the former President Trump is a threat to democracy. And then on the other side, you had the Trump folks. You had his spokespeople and also uh, his son, uh, Don Jr., and Eric Trump, and his wife, Laura Trump, who is now uh, one of the co, uh, the co chairwoman of the RNC, come out here and give their side of the story, saying, look, this is political persecution. We've, of course, heard that before, that this is election interference. And you have both of those camps outside of the courtroom. Meanwhile, the, the legal stuff that's actually going to impact, uh, you know, the future of the former president is going on inside the court. Really interesting split screen, Hallie. There's also this question, and everybody wants to know it. How does this trial affect the presidential campaign, the race for the White House now, as we are closing in on the first debate on both the Republican and the Democratic conventions? It's kind of a question mark, candidly, because you pull people about how they feel about a hypothetical. Yeah. It's one thing. You pull people about something that actually happens, like once we do eventually get, get a verdict, it's another. But there are some interesting signals here as it relates to independence. So we're looking at these numbers here. We're showing them on screen, Dasha. And I want to point people to the very last yep. row there, independent voters. If Donald Trump is convicted, would you be more or less likely to vote for Donald Trump? 23% of them say they'd be less likely to do so. Now, this is critical because we know that these margins are going to be very close in this race in November. So, you know, a few percentage points here or there could swing it. Is the Trump campaign sweating this at all? Well, they won't publicly let anyone see them sweat, right? You know this well. But you can see some of the signals in the messaging. We got a fundraising email yesterday where uh, the, the, the email asked voters, would you vote for me if I were arrested? We need a million responses by midnight to show that you're going to stay with the former president. This is their attempt to sort of dispel the notion that some people would change their minds were a conviction to happen. I'll tell you that anecdotally, Hallie, as I've been talking to voters, you're right, most people uh, I either are convinced that he's a criminal or think that this is persecution. But there are people that I've talked to that haven't been paying super close attention that have said, you know, it would be maybe a little bit tough to vote for someone that has, you know, convicts, that has that, that criminal record uh, next to their name. So it's an open question, but an important one. Dasha Burns, thank you very much. Let me bring in now for the big picture, Brian Stelter, a special correspondent for Vanity Fair. On all things, Brian, media, um, how this coverage is affecting the campaign, because it may be. Let me pull back up some of that video of Robert De Niro, because he went, he spoke. Uh, we'll play that in just a second. Got into it, too, with some of the pro-Trump protesters who were outside court, who have been there sort of demonstrating in support of former President Trump. Look at this moment. Um, you know, there's profanities apparently flying back and forth. Uh, in mm -hmm. this sense, did Donald Trump get what he wanted to some degree, which was a bit of a spectacle? I think that's true by the end of the trial. As the weeks have gone on, more of Trump's family members have joined him at court, so have GOP lawmakers. And now, as of today, the Biden campaign is trying to retaliate in some ways, putting on a spectacle outside the courthouse as well. But what was De Niro there to talk about? January 6th and Trump's threat to democracy. Biden's campaign wants to pivot to other topics, right? They want to make this about the rule of law without actually talking about the current trial underway. But as Dasha just said, if Trump is found guilty, Biden can go on for the rest of the year calling him a convicted felon. That's ultimately maybe why this will matter in November, if it does matter at all. We talked about, and our team is reporting more on how the Biden campaign is considering if, in fact, former President Trump does get convicted, trying to brand him with that convicted label. There's this interesting right. piece that I know caught your eye, too, in The New York Times, talking about how politically disengaged Americans have leaned toward Mr. Trump with this big question hanging over it. If they can get more engaged, could President Biden win them back? I wonder if this trial is doing enough to get those people to tune in, especially when numbers mm -hmm. show that about a third of Americans really just aren't following news coverage of this hush money trial to a big degree. Right. I don't think this trial is what moves the needle for people who are fatigued, 
burnt out and fed up by politics because what they hear from the periphery, from the outside, is that, oh, this is all part of the problem. But that idea of fatigue and political disengagement is one of the biggest stories of the year. Yeah. And it will make a huge difference in this election. I like to think that it's really kind of the result of almost a decade of the Trump effect in politics, supercharging his supporters but exhausting everyone else and causing a lot of people to tune out. Whether Biden is the right political figure to help people tune back in, I, I think that's a question that we will study for years to come. To that point, Brian, a senior campaign official for the Biden campaign tells me just in a conversation overnight, one of the things they're fighting against is the idea of natural amnesia that happens when Donald Trump, as much as he's been on the national stage, has not been in the White House for the past four years. And so to some degree, this is about reintroducing or at least reiterating the clear mm. contrast between these two candidates. Right, and this is all a full circle moment with this trial, because when was the first time we saw that nothing would, quote unquote, stick to Donald Trump? What was mm. the first moment where it seemed like uh, the natural laws McCain? of political gravity it... didn't apply? Yeah. Access Hollywood tape, and yeah. that's what's being litigated back in the courtroom today. But I would argue you could even go further back than that, Brian, right, to the days after he came down that golden escalator when he was attacking, for example, of, 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 of essentially a war hero in John McCain, et cetera. But to your point, um, it is a full circle moment there, it seems. Brian Stelter, thank you so much. It's good to see you. Thank you. A lot of other big headlines tonight. We're going to catch you up on all of it when we pick up our regular programming right after the break. We're coming on the air tonight with new pressure on the White House to answer what exactly does and does not qualify as crossing the president's red line in the Middle East as Israeli forces go deeper into Gaza than they've ever been just days after a strike killed dozens. We're live in the region. Plus, Dallas basically underwater as this cluster of storms moves through the south. Look at this. We've got a reporter on the ground in an area that's been slammed by this. Plus, the Vatican sending out a rare apology after the Pope reportedly used a homophobic slur. Why some people are shocked, given his track record on inclusivity with the LGBTQ plus community. Then, a new AI frontier. Why the makers of ChatGPT say their newest model could rival the intelligence of humans. Get ready, that's later in the show. Hey, I'm Hallie, and tonight you've got the White House pushing back on questions about whether Israel has crossed President Biden's so-called red line after Israeli tanks reached the center of the southern city of Rafah for the first time, according to the NBC News team on the ground. NSC spokesperson John Kirby saying they're not on the ground to see it themselves, but that it doesn't seem to have gotten to that red line point. Listen. We're going based on what the Israelis are telling us and what they're saying publicly and what we're able to discern as best we can, as best we can. As you and I speak here today, we have not seen a major ground operation. All of this is happening after intensifying international pressure, after an Israeli strike in southern Gaza sparked a fire that tore through a camp for displaced Palestinians. At least 45 people were reported to be killed. And then on top of it all, a big blow to the push to get food and medicine to people in Gaza who so desperately need it. With that temporary pier built by the U.S. military and used to drop off those supplies, that pier's been damaged because of bad weather. Raf Sanchez is live for us in Tel Aviv. Monica Alba is outside the White House. Raf, let me start with you and this question mark over whether or not Israel crossed a red line. How big of a turning point is this or could it become? So, Hallie, this is exactly what the world did not want to see. As you and I have been talking for months now, half the population of Gaza had fled to Rafa in search of safety. Humanitarian organizations said they had absolutely nowhere left to go that was safe, sealed Egyptian border behind them, an empty coast in front of them. And now we have Israeli forces fighting in the very center of that city. The United Nations estimates some one million Palestinian civilians have been displaced already. It is not clear where they're going to go. Our team have seen them today fleeing by donkey cart, fleeing in overloaded trucks, just desperately trying to get away from the fighting and get to safety. In terms of this red line, we are not yet seeing the levels of destruction in Rafah that we saw in Gaza City up in the north, where you just have block after city block completely leveled. But we are seeing very significant loss of life. You mentioned that strike early Monday morning, local time, a just absolute firestorm breaking out in a tent encampment after an Israeli airstrike. At least 45 people killed, many of them women and children. Many of them, Hallie, burned to death. And today, another Israeli strike in a different camp, 
killing 21 people, according to the Hamas-run health ministry. It is Alan. What is clear from some of the folks who have assessed what's happening in Gaza is that there is a need for humanitarian help to people there, an immediate need. This pier that the U.S. military helped build was supposed to be a big solve to that. Now it is damaged, huge blow to the humanitarian push there. What's the latest? Is it set to be repaired? What do we know? So the Pentagon is saying tonight, Hallie, that it will take at least a week to repair. And exactly as you said, this is a real, real setback at a time when the international community is fighting to fend off famine, especially in northern Gaza. The Rafah crossing from Egypt remains closed three weeks after Israel began its military operation. And the pier was seen as a big alternative route for trying to get food in. So this is a blow to the humanitarian effort. I think you could argue also, Hallie, that this is a blow to President Biden. Remember, he announced this at the State of the Union That's right. two months ago. The humanitarian group said at the time, this is not very practical. It would make more sense to pressure Israel to allow more aid in by land. The U.S. went ahead. It took two months to set up. And this pier has only been functioning for two weeks right. before what looks like pretty catastrophic damage and now this week at least needed of repairs. Alex. Raf Sanchez live for us in Tel Aviv. Raf, we're glad to have you there. Thank you. That brings us to Monica Alba, who's posted up outside the White House. What was interesting here, Monica? I think there was a lot of uh, a big spotlight on this Appreciate discussion it. today between John Kirby, the NSC spokesperson, and reporters who are pressing him about why Sunday's strike, the tanks in Rafa, et cetera, do not cross this red line. We played it in the introduction to this discussion. Kirby saying there's not evidence of a major ground operation. It feels like the key word is the word major, Mon. That's exactly right, Hallie. And when the president has been talking about threatening to condition support to Israel or change U.S. policy, the Biden administration is arguing they've always been talking about that in the context of a large-scale ground offensive into Rafah. And the U.S. assessment is that that's not happening yet. And then when we talk about this very deadly airstrike, of course, that then through a secondary explosion ignited that fuel tank that led to that fire that swept through the tents and the camp there in Rafah, killing those dozens of civilians. They're saying that that was an airstrike. That wasn't something that was on the ground. It wasn't an offensive or an incursion, again, in this larger term. So the Biden administration is trying to say that there are specific red lines, so they don't like to use that phrase, though they will for the sake of this argument, that they say haven't been crossed. But they are answering now to a lot of political pressure, not just from some progressive lawmakers and Democratic allies, but also to really the international community, Hallie, that has really roundly condemned this and wants to see the U.S. step up and do more and say more here. But it is still the assessment of the Biden administration that that larger ground offensive into Rafa hasn't happened, though they say if for instance, Israel did go, quote, smashing into Rafa. That's the language they've been using. They would reassess that. But instead, we know that for weeks, the U.S. officials have also been talking to Israeli officials about alternatives for how to approach Rafa. And it seems like some of these alternatives perhaps are being used, but they're still resulting in death and destruction. And just last week, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan used those words in saying, we're going to evaluate if there's a lot more death and destruction in Rafa whether we would shift our policy. But as of today, Hallie, there's absolutely no change to the U.S. stance in support of Israel in its war in Gaza. Monica Alva, live for us there back home in Washington. Mon, thank you. In Texas now, we're just getting in some really wild video of a plane at the Dallas airport literally getting blown away from the gate because of how windy it is. I want to show it to you here. Look at that. So that's an American Airlines plane. It, that's just the wind. That, that plane is not supposed to be doing that. The engines apparently were not turning it in that direction. That's just how gusty it was. Now, there was nobody on it, according to American. It was unoccupied. They're at least passengers. They're going to make, obviously, any necessary repairs here. It's just remarkable to look at when you add it to what else we're seeing in the Dallas area. Cars stranded in flooding on a major highway running through the city. Look at them. Basically, you know, underwater, at least up to the wheel wells, some of them. Tonight, you've got a million people in Texas who do not have power with a heat wave now hitting them, meaning no AC. The same string of deadly storms leaving at least 24 people dead across the South. I want to get to Adrian Broaddus, who's live for us on the ground in Dallas. It is stunning to see some of these images here, and you're looking at some of the destruction in person, Adrian. Talk us through it. 
Yeah, you talk about that win, Hallie. Just moments ago, I spoke to the business owner of this hardware construction store. He says when he showed up to work, the wind was so strong, he couldn't open the vehicle to get out. And minutes later, this is what he saw. Parts of the roof ripped out, but that's not all. That wind gust up to 77 miles per hour sent debris scattering across this parking lot. The lights that used to be above are now on the ground. And some of the folks in this area say they've seen some of the darkest days in the last week. As you can see, that old tree back there was uprooted from the bottom. I'm guessing by lightning or whatever the situation may be. As you can see, it kind of go takes its root, uproot through the, through the entire house. It's a really big tree. But, um, uh, so yeah, that's first steps are gonna be getting everything removed and uh, really just trying to, <laughs> trying to get it, to handle it the best way we can. And what's next, Hallie? Clean up. They will pick up lights and other debris like this. But it's important to underscore this is the second busiest start of the tornado season on record. Hallie? It's remarkable. Adrian Broaddus, thank you for being there. Appreciate you being on the ground. Uh, you and your crew, please stay safe. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, a Massachusetts man arraigned on multiple charges for a stabbing at a McDonald's over the holiday weekend. He allegedly drove into the drive-thru, got into some kind of confrontation with an employee, and then stabbed him with what appeared to be a big kitchen knife. The man then went inside the McDonald's and stabbed another employee. Both of those victims are expected to be okay. Number two, a man from Virginia avoiding a long prison sentence for illegally bringing ammunition while on vacation to Turks and Caicos. He's the second American now to skirt a potentially years-long sentence for this. Sentenced to just three weeks in prison. He's already served that time, so now He's basically off the hook as long as he pays a $9,000 fee. Number three, a billionaire now plans to take another submersible down to the Titanic wreck. Remember, this comes just about a year after five people were killed when the Ocean Gate submersible imploded. Now, this billionaire says he wants to show that the industry is safe, so he says he's planning to take a two-person submersible down that can allegedly dive about 200 meters lower than the Titanic wreck. So again, this announcement coming out now, TBD on when that journey would actually happen. Number four, a new study finds eating peanuts or peanut butter as a baby can really cut back on the chance of getting a peanut allergy longer term. The study shows that newborns up to the age of five, if they eat peanut products fairly regularly, then the chance of them getting an allergy when they're teenagers goes down by something like 70%. Number five, Melinda French Gates now says she'll donate a billion dollars over the next two years to support women's rights across the U.S and around the world, announcing in a New York Times op-ed, writing in part, as shocking as it is to contemplate, my one-year-old granddaughter may grow up with fewer rights than I had. Her new plan comes just weeks after she announced she's stepping down from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Coming up, the rush, rush to rescue a teenager who fell something like 400 feet down a canyon. We'll explain why first responders are calling this a miracle. First, a new apology after the Pope allegedly used an offensive slur, how the Vatican's explaining his reported word choice. New today, the Vatican apologizing and not really denying that Pope Francis used an offensive slur for gay men during a conversation with bishops last week. We've got some folks really shocked by this, especially because the Pope, in their view, has been pretty inclusive toward the LGBTQ plus community, even last year allowing priests to bless some same-sex couples. Claudio Lavanga is in Rome with more. According to Italian media, Pope Francis used an offensive gay slur during a closed-door meeting with bishops. Reports of the alleged incident first appeared on a political gossip website called Dago Spia and was later picked up by all major news outlets in Italy. The report said that during the meeting, a bishop asked the Pope what to do when gay men asked to be admitted to Catholic seminaries. The Pope reportedly said that he's against it because while it is important to embrace everyone, it was likely that a gay man could risk leading a double life. He then allegedly used a highly derogatory term in Italian to say that there are already too many gay men in seminaries. In a statement, the Vatican said the Pope never intended to offend or express himself in homophobic terms, and he extends his apologies to those who were offended by the use of that term. Well, according to Italian media, several bishops uh, defended the Pope by saying that 
he used the term jokingly and claimed that as an Argentinian who speaks Italian as a second language, he did not fully understand how offensive that word is. But despite the justification and the Pope's apology, it is an embarrassing episode for Pope Francis, who, since he was elected in 2011, he repeatedly reached out to gay Catholics. Now, one of his first and still most famous quotes is what he said on a flight back from Brazil only weeks after he was elected. He said, when it comes to homosexuality, who am I to judge? But now the judgment has turned on him for having allegedly used an unforgivable gay slur. Our thanks to Claudio for that reporting. To South Africa now, where people are getting ready to head to the polls tomorrow in what may be the country's most consequential election since the end of apartheid. That's because the ruling party is expected to get less dominant for the first time in many South Africans' lives. Josh Letterman reports on why that could mean such big changes. For three decades, power in South Africa has had a three-letter name, the ANC, the African National Congress, the political party of Nelson Mandela, a symbol of liberation from white minority rule and the downfall of apartheid. For those 30 years, the ANC has won election after election after election, but this time, maybe not. A host of smaller parties is giving the ANC a run for its money in tomorrow's election. Polls show that for the first time, the ANC could fall below 50%, potentially signaling a new era for one of Africa's most powerful nations. All our eyes are on whether the ANC will get 50 plus one, and if they don't, um, we are then beginning to imagine what would a coalition government mean um, for South Africa. What's behind the shift? Intense dissatisfaction with how life is going in South Africa. In the first years after apartheid, many voters credited the ANC with improving conditions for the poorest South Africans. The economy became more fair, especially for blacks. People felt like things were getting better. For the last 10 to 15 years, that's plateaued. Uh, and so there has been real rise in frustration with the government. It's easy to see why. Unemployment is hovering around an astounding 32 percent, the highest in the world. An energy crisis has triggered rolling blackouts across the country. And the ANC blamed for failing to rein in corruption and runaway violent crime. And then there's the issue of race and lingering inequality. I think one important fact, we haven't really transcended, um, you know, the issue of race as a country. And uh, this continues to play itself out, especially when young people are looking at the opposition parties and positioning themselves and trying to decide in terms of which political party can actually represent their interests. And for people under age 30, they've never known any government other than the ANC. For most of us that are immune, now we've never voted before so we would like to see something happen because ever since I existed I don't know maybe my parents I've never seen anything that is of change Josh Letterman is joining us now so Josh what happens if the ANC were to fall short of 50 percent well, it wouldn't be game over for the party necessarily, Hallie, because they are still likely to be the largest vote getter, right? They'd have what we call a plurality. And so the most likely thing that would happen next is the ANC would have to negotiate with one or more of those smaller parties to form a coalition. Now, that could significantly affect how the ANC is able to govern going forward. And it also would likely open up the floodgates to more political competition in the future, with a lot of voters saying, look, we understand the ANC has this huge legacy and history associated with liberation. But now we know that there are other parties that we can choose from as well. Now, after the voters go to the polls tomorrow, we're not expecting to get the full and final official results until Sunday. But based on the early projections that should start to come out, we will likely know which way this race is going to go within the next day or two. Allie? Josh Letterman, thank you for watching all of it. Appreciate it. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day. And because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Western Bureau, a team rescued after falling like 400 feet down a canyon in Washington State. Look at this. You see some of the video, or pictures at least. Crews are using this rope and a harness. They scaled the bridge, brought him up. 
Somehow only got some scrapes. The teens expected to be okay. Officials say half a dozen people fall off the bridge every year. Many of them die. Out of our Northeast Bureau, the Son of Sam killer who terrorized New York with a series of shootings back in the 70s is getting his new request for parole denied. It was his 12th time trying for it. He was sentenced to a max prison term of 25 years to life for each of his six murders in 1978 and became eligible for parole a few decades ago. TVD on whether he'll try again. Out of our Southern Bureau, two parents putting their lives at risk to save their kids and their fellow classmates. The teens were on a bus on the way to graduation, like this graduation celebration, when the driver started running through red lights and speeding. The parents got a call from their daughters. They could hear kids screaming in the background. They decided to drive their own car in front of the bus's path to get the driver to stop. The driver was allegedly under the influence. He was fired and arrested. Coming up, an Oscar-winning actor in a spotlight he may not want tonight. Reaction to that shocking anti-trans sexist rant from somebody who heard it live. New pictures tonight from inside the room where a Q&A with an Oscar-winning actor took a, well, unexpected turn. You see Richard Dreyfus here, coming out on stage after a screening of draw Jaws. He's got a dress on over his clothes before allegedly delivering a rant described by attendees as transphobic, sexist and homophobic. You see some of the images there. There's no video of what he actually said, but our Chloe Malas talked with somebody in the room who said they were stunned about what went down. Watch. This was intended to be a lighthearted evening about Jaws, an incredible film that so many people love. And to hear these transphobic comments it was painful and dehumanizing. Chloe Malas is joining us now. So this was supposed to be a Jaws chit chat turns into this rant that the movie theater that hosted this even had to apologize for. Yeah, I mean, the theater came out and issued this lengthy apology, but I do just want to back up Richard Dreyfus taking the stage, like you said, wearing a dress, coming out to Taylor Swift's love story, but it was in a mocking fashion, sits down, and although the conversation initially was about Jaws and, you know, talking about how it came out in 1975, such a big moment in his career, it then turned turned into conversation about the Me Too movement, to which Richard Dreyfus allegedly um, called out woke culture and said it's the same people that called out individuals during the Me Too movement that also are the ones that support 10 and 11 year old children wanting to move forward with changing their uh, genders, um, also attacking the parents, also attacking women, criticizing Barbara Streisand um, while working on Close Encounters, saying that women should be submissive that women are meant to be passive and that women should not have a voice. I spoke to Sarah Hogg, who you heard from just a moment ago, who was in the audience with their partner. Mm -hmm. And Sarah said that people started leaving the theater wow. in droves and that maybe the reason why there isn't actual video footage of this is that people were so disgusted that they didn't even think to take out their phone. They thought about just getting out of there. Take a listen. Many people walked out, including myself and my partner. Numerous other patrons who were at the Cabot also found it unacceptable. There were scores of people filing down the stairs and out onto the sidewalk. Wow. So I also just want to read to you a little bit about what the Cabot Theater said. This is a very well-known theater in Beverly, Massachusetts, right near Salem. And they said, we are so sorry. This was not what the conversation was meant to be about. The statement went on to say how much they regret this happening, how disappointed they are in Richard Dreyfus. But again, doesn't really go into the details of exactly what he said. But they said that they take full responsibility for the oversight and not anticipating the direction of the conversation and the discomfort it caused to so many people. I don't know how anybody could have expected that Richard Dreyfus would, Dreyfus would take such a turn, but he has said offensive things in the past. I want you to take a listen to something he said last year about the Film Academy's new inclusion rules and what he had to say on PBS. They make me vomit to be telling me as an artist that I have to give in to the latest, most current idea of what morality is. And what are we risking? Are we really risking hurting people's feelings? NBC News, we have reached out to Richard Dreyfus uh, for comments, uh, and we have not yet heard back on what happened over the weekend.
Laura Malas, thank you for your reporting on this. Appreciate it. Good to see you. We got a lot more to get to here in the show, including the biggest name in AI saying it's time to focus on safety. We'll tell you how open AI is trying to protect folks even as it gears up for AI that could be smarter than all of us. So today, you've got the developer of ChatGPT rolling out this so-called next frontier model of AI technology that could get us all a little closer to AI that's smarter than the rest of us. Might not be hard. Something called Artificial General Intelligence, AGI. And it comes when AI has obviously been front and center at this discussion of safety with the technology getting more and more advanced. Brian Chung is joining us now. What is AGI? Like, how, what should we be worried? What's up? Yeah, well, there's a lot of questions over, like, what AGI means relative to the AI. The difference is not just a G. That general implies that it's technology that can essentially do more human reasoning. So AI right now, it has specific tasks, right? Tell me how many uh, legs an elephant has. Uh, help me drive my car. Uh, but AGI has the ability to maybe do complex things together, uh, walk and talk, if you will. Uh, again, not just necessarily in a, in, a, in, a, in a solid sense like that, but able to uh, put together different pieces. So this is the next frontier that OpenAI has says their development is headed towards. They said in a cryptic uh, blog post today that we quote, we anticipate the resulting systems to bring us to the next level of capabilities, uh, hinting that this could come sometime soon. So they're putting together a committee to try to police uh, and make sure that this next step that OpenAI might be making is going to be done in a responsible manner. Again, this is coming as they just unveiled a few weeks ago that GPT-4.0, again, most people will be familiar with that version of OpenAI as the one that had that voice similar to Scarlett. Johansson, again, this is the next step that they hope to make going from AI to AGI. Well, you mentioned this and we showed it up on screen, this committee to try to deal with some of these safety and security discussions and decisions around this. But, you know, worth pointing out, it's the company that's behind the technology also working to safeguard the technology. How does that compute? Yeah, there are a number of OpenAI's own members that are going to be part of this subcommittee, which is basically a broken out part of their board that's going to do a 90 day review of the potential risks and also opportunities of this jump from AI to AGI. And again, as you mentioned, there are a number of people within OpenAI that are going to be part of that, including, of course, Sam Altman, the head of OpenAI entirely. But there's also Brett Taylor, uh, who was the former CEO over at Salesforce, in addition to Nicole Seligman, who was over at Sony. Uh, but this is a, a very much in focus because the personnel behind this technology is very much in view. You had Ilya Sutsagever, who was the uh, former uh, chief technology officer of this company that recently just left. He was behind that. You remember public spat where uh, Sam Altman was actually replaced yeah. as a head of OpenAI for a brief moment. So this is very much a, an interesting musical chair situation. But again, this is the uh, part of the board that's going to be tasked with making sure that this AGI isn't technology that's going to ultimately come back to harm humanity potentially something we'll have to watch very closely. Uh, no, no less of stakes than that. Brian Chung, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Good to see you. That does it for us for this hour. We've got more coverage picking up right now. We're coming on the air with the beginning of the end in the criminal trial of former President Trump with prosecutors still going tonight but saying that Mr. Trump defrauded the American people. The defense trying to paint their client as somebody who wouldn't even have the time to be part of something like this. We're going to take you to downtown Manhattan with a gut check on where things stand and when the jury may get the case. Then, Israeli forces going deeper into Gaza than they've ever been, just days after a strike killed dozens. We're live in the region. Plus, super intense winds in Dallas. So strong, they literally moved a plane. Look at this. That plane's not going on its own. That's just the weather. We've got a reporter on the ground in Dallas with more on how this area is trying to recover. Plus, what has Argentinian soccer players on the women's team mad enough that they quit? The treatment they say has them feeling humiliated. Plus, the new research that's adding to these calls from health experts to give your little kids peanuts or peanut butter, how it could significantly cut their chances of developing a life-threatening allergy later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and right now we are super close to the finish line in Donald Trump's trial. You've got prosecutors still going, but rounding the corner, we think, on the last stretch of their closing argument to those 12 New Yorkers, asking them to make history right now, to convict a former president, to convict Republicans' pick to be the next one. You see Mr. Trump in one of the breaks we've gotten on this long day, now up to seven hours of closings, a case that centers around 34 felony counts 
that Mr. Trump, you see it here, lied on business records to cover up alleged hush money payments to former adult film star Stormy Daniels for an affair that Mr. Trump denies. Now, prosecutors say, listen, this whole thing is election interference. That's the case they're making now. But before they did, the defense had their turn, setting up their argument in three big buckets. Prosecutors had an answer for all of it. First, Trump attorney Todd Blanche says, you can't convict Donald Trump because these documents, they're not lies. They're legal retainers to former Trump fixer Michael Cohen. Now, in just the last 30 minutes, however, prosecutors are calling documents like these the smoking guns, saying the receipts, the documents are so damning you almost have to laugh. Now, the defense is painting a picture of Mr. Trump as somebody who's way too busy to be part of a scheme like this. He was the president, after all, they say. Prosecutors, look what they say. They're reminding the jury this didn't just start with that key 2017 meeting at the White House. This began years before with schemes to, in their words, catch and kill stories to help him get elected. So it all comes down to this man, Michael Cohen, Donald Trump's former fixer, his former attorney, the star witness, the guy to connect the dots back to Mr. Trump himself. And you know the defense targeted Cohen hard. They went after his credibility in a catchy way, they think, calling him the MVP of liars and the gloat, the greatest liar of all times. Not the goat, but the gloat. The defense says these lies are proof the jury can't rely on Cohen. But prosecutors are like, hey, I'm quoting here, we didn't pick Cohen up at the witness store. He's here because Donald Trump chose him to be his fixer. They don't call him the gloat. They call him the tour guide through the physical evidence, through those documents, who gives context to this case. Now, through it all, this interesting split screen that happened outside court, what you're looking at here, that's Robert De Niro in that crowd, right? He was sent by the Biden campaign as this surrogate of sorts to show up to make the case against former President Trump and what is really the most muscular move we've seen from the Biden campaign since this trial began. Mr. Trump's son later trying to light things up himself. We're going to break down all the legal and political questions you have with our team that's been all over this. I want to start outside court with Rahema Ellis. Let me pull up those two documents that in just the last 30 minutes, Prosecutor Josh Steinglass referred to as the smoking guns. Exhibit 35 is the statement from First Republic Bank that shows a wire transfer to Stormy Daniels' former attorney. The second one, Exhibit 36, this handwritten agreement to pay $420,000 to Michael Cohen. Explain this, Rahema. Yeah, one of the things they're talking about, Hallie, is that the Weisselberg document and the one that Jeffrey McConney was involved in, these two men worked for decades for Donald Trump. And they were the people who were helping to handle the money and make certain that the money would go in the appropriate places. And Steinberg is trying to, Steinglass, I'm sorry, is trying to impress upon the jury that in no way would these two be involved in something that was other than what Cohen was talking about, and that was reimbursing him. The idea that it was $130,000 grossed up twice, that was because, of Steinglass says, Michael Cohen was in the 50% tax bracket. So in order to make certain that he was made whole, if you will, for putting out $130,000 in that home equity loan, they had to gross it up. They had to make it twice as much. And so he is hammering home that point with these juries that when the defense says this is not to be believed, Steinglass is saying you have every possible, every reason to believe it is. As you pointed out, he says, these two documents are the smoking gun in this case. Hallie? So, Rahema, here we are now, rounding the corner, perhaps, to maybe the last hour of closings. We talked about the judge says 7 p.m. It's 6.05 Eastern right now. So in just about 55 minutes, they're going to kind of assess and get a gut check of where they are for the rest of the night. Talk us through some of the key moments that we've seen so far from both sides. Yeah, one of the things I have to say, because I was in the overflow courtroom this morning, and the way that the defense and Blanche was presenting their arguments, it could make you a little bit sleepy if you didn't have to pay attention for it, if it wasn't you, your job as a juror and not your job, and if it wasn't your job as a correspondent. But when mm. Steinglass came on, he was dramatic, and he was very, very strong in his presentation. And I, it, it woke me up. I think it woke up a lot of people. But I have to say the jurors have been attentive throughout. Take a look at this full screen in terms of what the defense is trying to make an argument about their closing arguments. Todd Blanche said, this isn't a referendum on your views of President Trump. This is not a referendum on the ballot box. Steinglass, he counters that by saying Trump's prosecutor's closing arguments. He points out, we didn't choose Michael Cohen as a witness. We didn't pick him up at the witness store. The defendant chose Michael Cohen. He was uh, Donald Trump's fixer. And for that, you need to believe him.
Callie. Rahema Ellis, live for us there in downtown Manhattan. Rahema, thank you very much. I want to bring in now our senior legal correspondent, Laura Jarrett, who has been in court, and Danny Savalos, our NBC News legal analyst as well. Laura, let me start with you here. Take us inside court, right? It is a long day, not just for the reporters and the many people who showed up to be there, but for the jurors, of course. At one point, I think you noticed one juror fully staring at the ceiling, like given, given the neck a good stretch, it seems. Did both sides keep their attention? What were the moments that you noticed? I think, you, you know what, Hallie, these jurors are human beings just like the rest of us. And so at times they're attentive, they're taking notes, they're looking at the evidence on the screens in front of them. But as things stretched on, and certainly I think as the prosecution stretched into territory that doesn't necessarily bear on the actual charges in this case, but more sort of describing the atmospherics, describing the context describing a longer pattern, a conspiracy, if you will, to catch and kill damaging stories, as we've heard so much over these last six weeks. At that point, I think it was after lunch, and one of the jurors sort of rocks her head back and just sort of taking it all in. I didn't, I didn't see anyone sleeping, but I definitely think interest was sort of waning, ebbs and flows, as you can imagine, throughout what has really been a marathon cross-examination, yeah. Hallie. I'd be interested to see what Danny says. I have never seen prosecutors in a case really as simple as this, a books and records charge, go on for this long. This is not some sort of complex financial transaction involving a lot of tricky issues. The legal issues are a little bit tricky, but the actual evidence is not. And I'm surprised that the prosecution has made this choice to go on what is close to be over now four hours. And it'll be interesting to see whether they can wrap it all up um, in the next hours. I know the prosecution is trying to do that, but the judge really wants them to wrap yeah. up tonight so they can start fresh first thing tomorrow with jury instructions. Laura, only because you mentioned Danny and you wanted to know what he thought, let me bring him in. Danny, were you surprised that the prosecution is going so long? What do you make of that real quick? Yes and no. I mean, on the one hand, I totally get how, as observers, we can say, well, you got to tighten this up or edit it out a little bit. But I also sympathize with the prosecutor. This is the most important case of his career. It is not likely he will ever again try a case hmm. of this legal significance. You don't want to be the cautionary tale of, oh, if he'd only discussed this issue or why did you leave this fact out? You want to put in every single fact. And unfortunately, uh, you do that at the cost of efficiency. You do that at the cost of the potential and probable boredom of these jurors. And in a sense, any white collar case, and that's what mm. this is, uh, is going to likely bore the jurors at some point. It's not exciting. It's as Laura put it, it's documents, it's records. Yeah. They're pretty straightforward, but they're documents and records. And that's going to get a little dry. Laura, let me go back to you here, because for the defense, they really only need to bloom the seed of doubt in the mind of one juror, of one of these 12 New Yorkers who will decide this case here. That's you saw right. Todd Blanche lay out this kind of, with apologies to Letterman, like a top 10 list of all the reasons why there is enough reasonable doubt in this case <laughs> that the jury should not convict. The prosecutors tried to rebut that with their own list. How did that work? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. The defense, I thought, did a, a really um, a, a really efficient job attacking Cohen, much more efficient than we saw mm. in the cross-examination, which was sort of sprawling. Today was sort of the greatest hits. And then they went back and tried to sum it all up. And at that point, I think Blanche was worried about the jury's interest waning. And so he sort of raced through that top 10 list. But I think it, they focused a lot more today than we've ever heard in the entire trial from the defense on the actual falsification, on the actual alleged crime, on the actual records themselves. And on that point, I thought they actually were pretty effective in sco scoring some points, essentially saying Trump didn't know anything about a drop down menu on an internal business software. He's relying mm. on the people who have worked for him for years to do that. And the prosecution doesn't have to prove that he actually went in the system himself and typed in legal retainer, but they do have to prove that he caused false records to be made. And on that point, I think the defense, the defense did a, a pretty effective job in trying to at least poke holes in that. As you point out, Hallie, they don't need 12 people to That's agree. Right. They just need one holdout for this case to be deadlocked. And words matter. You pointed out uh, that it is important that the prosecutor repeatedly calls Mr. Trump the defendant. We did not hear that same kind of language from the defense. No, not at all. They referred to him through the out this trial as President Trump deliberately. They said they were going to do it in opening statements, and they have stuck with that for their client. Laura Jarrett, thank you so much. We'll see you tonight on Nightly News. We look forward to it. Danny, let me go to you here, because uh, one of the things that you and I have talked about 
casually in our office discussing Trump trial things, as we are wont to do, was this issue of the so-called empty chair defense, right? The idea that so much of this relies on Michael Cohen's word, pinning Donald Trump, connecting the Donald Trump dot directly to this scheme, having to do with this critical meeting between Cohen, Trump, and Alan Weisselberg, the former Trump CFO. He wasn't called. The prosecutors did not call him. Um, explain that. Explain why you were surprised that the defense didn't make more of a big deal out of that. I was surprised. I thought they would focus a little more on that, maybe a little less on Michael Cohen as a liar. I mean, you think you, you can make that point and move on. I felt like that might have been a little repetitive, but they did hit the point of Alan Weisselberg. They did hit the point of Keith Schiller. They did hit that they were absent. Uh, Mr. Trump's children as well. Those are all effective arguments that other people were involved. The key pieces of evidence, uh, Exhibit 35 and 36, I believe they are, uh, they literally have Weisselberg's handwriting all over them. So you make that the centerpiece of your defense. And I think that's what, uh, that's what I think would have uh, resonated with me. But it's often little tidbits. Like Laura pointed out, I thought I couldn't have agreed with her more. What a compelling point that the choice to call this legal services was a drop-down menu. That may have taken no more than a minute out of the closing argument, but to me, that's the kind of thing as a juror, I might seize on and mm. say, wow, that really brings it home. I, at my office, we work with drop-down menus. You just sort of click it, and it's just an arbitrary decision. Should we hold this defendant responsible for that? That's an example of the tiny little choices, something that only takes a minute to reference, but it could make all the difference in this case. So as we look ahead now to what could happen tomorrow, and again, I think a, a key moment's gonna be in about 45 minutes here when we find out, will the prosecution continue its closing tomorrow morning? Will the jury get the instructions first thing tomorrow morning? It looks likely they're gonna have the case by at least tomorrow afternoon. What are the options here, right? I mean, what are the, what are the options on the table? It's not simply like a conviction on all counts or an acquittal on all counts. Yes, those are options. You can have a hung jury on certain counts and convict on the others. There's a teensy-weensy chance, of course, in theory, that the judge could grant a directed verdict, which he's held under consideration. That is not, there's 0.0, .0 chance of that happening, in my view. Or if there is a chance, it's way more decimal points than 0, .0. Okay. So it's just not likely to happen. Danny Savalas, thank you. We'll talk many times, I know, over the course of the next few days. I want to break this more down with uh, two folks who know former President Trump. They've covered the campaign, the case, New York Times investigative reporter Suzanne Craig, Puck's senior political correspondent Tara Palmieri. It is good to have you both here on set in New York. Thanks for being here. Suzanne, I'll go to you first because you've been like in or near or touching the courtroom pretty much every day since this trial began. Yeah. Here we are now in closings as they continue on with the prosecution even into the evening here. Right. Give me your thoughts. What has stood out? I think that I'm thinking about Michael Cohen. Okay. And I think that what's interesting about it is I think what the government has done is both said they've given jurors a path, either not believe him or believe him, but they've, they've really leaned on the documents and said there's a great case here. So, so you there's don't literally have to, a mountain of evidence. There's literally yeah. a mountain yeah. of evidence. And he's really a narrator through that. And also, I also think they're saying, look, it's not a binary choice. You, you, you can just not just because he's lied and he's done all these things, you can still believe him on some things. Mm. So I think that that's sort of where I landed today. I, I was just curious about some of the decisions that, uh, that, the, um, that the defense made starting off. I just, I thought it was pretty choppy in terms of the, the presentation. And I just think they also missed some things. Like they were, they were saying things like, you know, these were legitimate legal payments. And... I just, I think it was really interesting to hear that given, you know, then you bring in that Exhibit 35 that's become really mm. important, mm -hmm. you know, where Alan Weisselberg and Has Michael Cohen, they all hashed that out, and then Michael Cohen allegedly took it to Donald Trump and he signed off on it. It's interesting, if they're saying those are legitimate legal payments, they are written on a trans on the transfer, the government, or the, sorry, the bank transfer form, it's the transfer payment for the Stormy Daniels payment. Like, it just, it doesn't add up. I think there's just some common sense that came out of it, and that was one of the things that really struck me this morning. The prosecution, even tonight, even as we are having this yeah. conversation here on set, is trying to make to the, the case to the jury here, and Steinglass is saying, essentially, that Donald Trump knew what was up. They're saying, despite his frugality and attention to detail, the defendant didn't ask any questions because he already knew the answers, saying the cardinal sin for Mr. Trump is overpaying 
for anything, okay. right? Trying to show that this the defense has painted two different pictures of who Donald Trump actually is, that they can't have it both ways. Right, they can't believe the guy that wrote how to be a billionaire, and that means never pay anything, pay more for anything, micromanage everything. That was his, you know, guide that was to, his being, thing, yeah. to being a, a millionaire, and also a billionaire, and according to him. Um, and <clears throat> also, the people that he kept around him, you're supposed to, um, you know, I thought it was interesting that they said, we don't love Michael Cohen mm. as our star witness, but this is his lawyer. This is the person this is that the guy he, he chose. Picked. Right. Exactly. Right. This isn't... So in some sense, yeah, you could have had Alan Weitzelberg come on, but he had this sort of agreement, this, you know, silence agreement, $2 million severance right. to go to prison, essentially, and he wasn't going to turn. And yeah, there are a lot of questions I'm sure the jury's going to have about why more people weren't brought in and why it's just documents and Michael Cohen. And and I could see them really deliberating on that. I mean, it's a really big decision. This is one of those kind of, you know, this is a, the president, a former president. And yeah. I remember covering the John Edwards trial, and that was a jury that was, like, hung for almost, it ended up being a hung jury, but they deliberated for six weeks or something like that. It was wow. insane. It was just such a long period of time. I think you feel the gravity of the case from the press around you, yeah. from the the... Even the story, it's like sorted. There's comp and, and it sets precedent. Like maybe the FEC never actually charged Trump with um, the same crime as John Edwards, which is pr they're pretty yeah. similar because the prosecution lost in that case. The other thing that I thought was interesting about the documents, there was a big thing made that, you know, that Donald Trump didn't know about the invoices that Michael Cohen sent in, that he didn't know about yeah. this or that. He doesn't have to know. He just has to have caused the filing of the false documents. And I think that that was sort of an important point that, you know, when the when the government was bringing it up, they were, you know, they were going on and on and right. on about, you know, Donald Trump's so busy, he didn't know about this, that he didn't have to know. He just had to have caused it. When he found out about it, that he caused the filing of the false documents. To the point that Tara's making, too, the idea that this has become, in some ways, kind of a spectacle, a court. I mean, you've seen it, I'm yeah. sure, Suzanne, walking in and out today. We had this sort of remarkable split-screen moment where inside court, you've got the this marathon session of right. closing arguments. Outside court, you have, like... Corleone, right? Robert De Niro showing up right. as a kind of surrogate now for the Biden campaign in what is really its most visceral sort of push against this trial that we've seen since it began. I want to play just a bit of that here from oh, De Niro. Donald Trump wants to destroy not only the city, but the country, and eventually he could destroy the world. Focus on January 6th. Suzanne, have you seen this spectacle grow? I, I think I was going to say it has been growing. And today is the first day we saw a Biden surrogate. And I think for the most part, Joe Biden has tried to stay out of it. Donald Trump has said that this is a Joe Biden, you know, prosecution and all these things. And you've really seen Biden shy away from it. During, you know, he released the challenge of the, uh, when, when the debate, he challenged him to a debate. He said, I hear you're free on Wednesdays at the end of that tape. But he's really shied away from yeah. it. But every day we have seen um, since, really since Michael Cohen took the stand for the first time, we have seen a parade of surrogates come in. Donald Trump has bought a collection yes. of people from vice presidential hopefuls to just random supporters. His today, own family members. Today, three, three or four of his family members mm -hmm. were there, and they go out in the lunch hour, and they have press conferences. I'm always coming back to the courtroom and, and wondering how the jury is processing that. At first, it wasn't as noticeable, but it comes very noticeable because sometimes there's two rows. I sit in the overflow room, and yep. I can see everything on a screen. So I see Donald Trump sitting at the defense table, and then behind him, there's often two solid rows of people and their supporters. Some of them are probably recognizable to the jurors, and many of them are on their phone. It's just increasingly become a distract distraction. It's so interesting, yeah. it, but it does bring us to, I think, the, the point that politics. Th this thing that people, exactly, politics, this question everybody has, I get it all the time, you probably do too, what does this mean for the campaign? What does this mean for the presidential campaign? We have to be real, we don't yet know, because it depends on what right. happens, right? right? It depends on, people feel different about hypotheticals than they do about actual practical facts in front of them. And time changes yeah, how you feel about 100%. things, so if there's a verdict this, you know, this week, and we know he's a convicted felon, those same independent voters may not really care in November if they're feeling cast Still months away. Even though you have about 23% right. of them, according to new polling from 
from last week saying that they, if he were to be convicted in this trial, they would be less likely to vote for him. The question is, right, does that hold? Yeah, exactly. We really don't know. I don't think I would trust any snap polling, to be honest, that comes out of this. I would want to wait and see how that uh, factors. But this is an election that will be won on the margin. That's so right. we have to also think about how those independent voters are going to um, think about this. Suzanne, Tara, uh, I can't believe we may be at the last week here of this hush money yeah. trial, or maybe not. We'll see. Thank you both for being here with us in New York. Appreciate it. We've got a lot more to get to tonight, including the White House back home in Washington tonight, pushing back on questions over whether Israel crossed President Biden's so-called red line. That's after Israeli tanks got to the center of Rafah in Gaza for the first time, according to our NBC News team on the ground. The NSC spokesperson, John Kirby, saying, listen, they're not on the ground to see it themselves, but it doesn't seem to have gotten to that crossing of the red line point. Listen. We're going based on what the Israelis are telling us and what they're saying publicly and what we're able to discern as best we can, as best we can. As you and I speak here today, we have not seen a major ground operation. All of it coming after intensifying international pressure after an Israeli strike in southern Gaza sparked a fire that tore through a camp for displaced Palestinians. At least 45 people were reported to be killed. And on top of it all, this big blow to the push to get food and medicine to people in Gaza who so desperately need it. With that temporary pier that was just really finished up fairly recently by the U.S. military, used to drop off those supplies, damaged in bad weather. Raf Sanchez is in Tel Aviv for us tonight. Monica Alba is in Washington. Raf, let me start with you and this question mark over whether or not Israel crossed a red line. How big of a turning point is this or could it become? So, Hallie, this is exactly what the world did not want to see. As you and I have been talking for months now, half the population of Gaza had fled to Rafah in search of safety. Humanitarian organizations said they had absolutely nowhere left to go that was safe, sealed Egyptian border behind them, an empty coast in front of them. And now we have Israeli forces fighting in the very center of that city. The United Nations estimates some one million Palestinian civilians have been displaced already. It is not clear where they're going to go. Our team have seen them today fleeing by donkey cart, fleeing in overloaded trucks, just desperately trying to get away from the fighting and get to safety. In terms of this red line, we are not yet seeing the levels of destruction in Rafah that we saw in Gaza City up in the north, where you just have block after city block completely leveled. But we are seeing very significant loss of life. You mentioned that strike early Monday morning local time, a just absolute firestorm breaking out in a tent encampment after an Israeli airstrike. At least 45 people killed, many of them women and children. Many of them, Halle, burned to death. And today, another Israeli strike in a different camp, killing 21 people, according to the Hamas run health ministry. It Halle. is what is clear from some of the folks who have assessed what's happening in Gaza is that there is a need for humanitarian help to people there, an immediate need. This peer that the U.S. military help build was supposed to be a big solve to that. Now it is damaged, huge blow to the humanitarian push there. What's the latest? Is it set to be repaired? What do we know? So the Pentagon is saying tonight, Hallie, that it will take at least a week to repair. And exactly as you said, this is a real, real setback at a time when the international community is fighting to fend off famine, especially in northern Gaza. The Rafah crossing from Egypt remains closed three weeks after Israel began its military operation. And the pier was seen as a big alternative route for trying to get food in. So this is a blow to the humanitarian effort. I think you could argue also, Halle, that this is a blow to President Biden. Remember, he announced this at the State of the Union That's right. two months ago. The humanitarian group said at the time, this is not very practical. It would make more sense to pressure Israel to allow more aid in by land. The U.S. went ahead. It took two months to set up. And this pier has only been functioning for two weeks right. before what looks like pretty catastrophic damage and now this week at least needed of repairs. Out. Raf Sanchez live for us in Tel Aviv. Raf, we're glad to have you there. Thank you. I want to bring in Monica now for the view from the White House. And Mon, it seems like the focus, at least from what we heard from John Kirby earlier, was on this idea of it not being a major ground offensive with an emphasis on the word major. It's doing a lot of work. Exactly, Hallie. And for a long time, the Biden administration has said, we don't want to really put this in the terms of red lines. But for the sake of this conversation, they said that that so-called red line for the president 
would be a major ground offensive into Rafa, which the U.S. assesses has not happened yet. So they are really talking about this in the specifics and the details. They're saying that that deadly airstrike that resulted in that second explosion ignited the fuel tank that then led to that really horrific fire that swept through the tent camps was not what would, again, qualify as something that would violate the red line and that they are still talking to Israeli officials about how to go into Rafah in a more targeted way. But I'm not sure if you can hear behind me, Hallie, there is a very large protest outside the White House right now with pro-Palestinian demonstrators chanting, hands off Rafah now, stop bombing Rafah now, and calling President Biden a coward, which really shows you that in this moment there is some reaction Action here domestically, but from the international community as well, roundly condemning this and asking the president and the White House to step up, say more, and do more in the wake of this horrific incident. Hallie. Monica Alba, that is audible behind you. Mon, thank you very much for that. Much more to get to coming up here, including how a second American seems to be skirting a years-long prison sentence for bringing ammo on his island vacation. Plus, why another billionaire is planning to take a trip down to the Titanic. to Texas now, and you got to see this, this wild video we're just getting in of a plane in Dallas. This is at the Fort Worth airport. It is literally getting blown away from the gate because of how strong the wind is. Look at this. That is not the plane moving because it's being steered that direction. That is just the gust of wind blasting that plane across the tarmac like that. Now, American Airlines says nobody was on board. No passengers, no crew, nothing. No injuries, obviously, and fortunately, they're going to do whatever necessary repairs they have to. The wind pushing that thing got up to about 80 miles an hour, apparently. That's just one of the scenes we're seeing from the Dallas area. Look at this one. Cars stranded and flooding on a big highway running through the city. You see some of them underwater up to the wheel wells. They can't move in the middle of this storm. Tonight, a million people in Texas do not have power. And oh, by the way, guess what? There's a heat wave. They have no AC, even as the temperatures are soaring. The same string of deadly storms has left at least 24 people dead down south. I want to get to Adrian Bradas, who's on the ground for us in Dallas tonight. It is stunning to see some of these images here, and you're looking at some of the destruction in person, Adrian. Talk us through it. Yeah, you talk about that wind, Hallie. Just moments ago, I spoke to the business owner of this hardware construction store. He says when he showed up to work, the wind was so strong, he couldn't open the vehicle to get out. And minutes later, this is what he saw. Parts of the roof ripped out, but that's not all. That wind gust up to 77 miles per hour sent debris scattering across this parking lot. The lights that used to be above are now on the ground. And some of the folks in this area say they've seen some of the darkest days in the last week. As you can see, that old tree back there was uprooted from the bottom. I'm guessing by lightning or whatever the situation may be. As you can see, it kind of go takes its root, uproot through the, through the entire house. It's a really big tree. But, um, so yeah, that's the first steps are going to be getting everything removed and uh, really just trying to, <laughs> trying to get it, to handle it the best way we can. And what's next, Hallie? Clean up. They will pick up lights and other debris like this. But it's important to underscore this is the second busiest start of the tornado season on record. Hallie? It's remarkable. Adrian Bratis, thank you for being there. Appreciate you being on the ground. To Argentina now, where three players for that country's women's soccer team are furious because they say they're not being valued, that they're being humiliated. They say the Argentinian Football Association told them they're not going to get paid ahead of a couple of friendlies games against Costa Rica coming up because those games are at home. Players also say conditions at national squad training sessions are not up to par with what high-performance athletes should be getting. Two of the players posting on Instagram, all they were given during practice was a ham and cheese sandwich and a banana. We've reached out to hold them over, basically. We've reached out to the Argentine Football Association about this and have not heard back. But I want to bring in Maura Barrett now. This is a team that was granted professional status five years ago. The Football Association's president said that the women's contract would mirror the men's. Okay. Like, f fact check that, right? Are the men also getting ham sandwiches and bananas for their lunch? 
So we did reach out. We haven't gotten specifics in terms of what they're getting uh, food-wise or pay-wise, but they, uh, the president was very clear that they wanted to have a balance with this gender equality. Clearly, these women uh, are not satisfied, and it definitely doesn't seem like that's what's going on here. It's important to note, though, that there is an overall dissatisfaction with the league's president, even uh, for decisions that have been made on the men's side in terms of where they're playing and when. Uh, there's a lot of criticism from within the league and fans that say that he's putting uh, profit over performance. Uh, and so that's something that's a very big talking point in the country as well. But going back to uh, this situation, the three women that walked off the team were all a regular starters, which meant that they were on the field a lot of the time, a lot of eyeballs on them. Uh, and this was Lorena Oliveros, who was their goalkeeper, Julieta Cruz, uh, one of the defenders, and Lorena Benitez, who's a midfielder. Uh, and they basically said, they said on the, in their post that they reached a point in which they are tired of the injustices of not being valued, not being heard. They're saying that they need improvements around not just the finances. One of them also writing that she has a broken heart and thousands of dreams are, of hers are disappearing little by little. Uh, this is something following Estefania Benini, who's con considered the country's leading soccer player. She also stepped down recently, decided not to play on the national team anymore, also citing gender inequity. And so she posted on social media today supporting her former teammates, saying, matter of time, thank you for daring to speak. Uh, and so this is something we'll continue to, to follow. Uh, and this is not the first time that the team uh, has gone on strike. So again, we have not gotten any uh, comment from the Argentinian Football Association as of right now, Hallie. All right, Maura Barrett, thank you very much. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, a man from Virginia now avoiding a long prison sentence for illegally bringing ammo to his vacation on Turks and Caicos. He's the second American now to avoid a potentially years long sentence for doing this. He was sentenced to three weeks in prison, but already served that time. So now he's basically off the hook as long as he pays a $9,000 fine. Number two, we're now hearing from the family of the general hospital actor shot and killed in LA. Johnny Wachter's mother and brothers telling NBC News he was leaving his second job with a coworker when he saw somebody near his car. Wachter went up to him, stepped in front of the coworker and then was shot. Police say the killer and two other people were trying to remove the car's catalytic converter. Wachter's family calling him a hero. Police are still looking for those suspects. Number three, billionaire Larry Connor now plans to take another submersible down to the Titanic wreck. Remember, five people were killed last year when the Ocean Gate submersible imploded. Now, this billionaire says he wants to show the industry safe. He's going to take a two-person sub that can allegedly dive around 200 meters lower than the Titanic wreck. TBD, though, on when that journey would actually happen. Number four, Melinda French Gates says she plans to donate a billion dollars over the next couple years to support women's rights, announcing this in a New York Times op-ed, writing in part, as shocking as it is to contemplate, my one-year-old granddaughter may grow up with fewer rights than I have. Her new plan coming just weeks after she announced she's stepping down from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Number five, a controversial MLB umpire says he's retiring to spend more time with his family. Angel Hernandez had a three-decade-long career, got a lot of heat from players and fans over missed calls and quick ejections. He also unsuccessfully sued Major League Baseball for racial discrimination. Hernandez saying he's had a very good experience living out his childhood dream. Coming up, how the feds found literally tons of drugs on a fishing boat in the middle of the ocean. The news shocking some folks, especially because the Pope has been pretty inclusive toward the LGBTQ plus community, even last year, allowing priests to bless same sex couples. Our Claudio Lavanga is in Rome with more. According to Italian media, Pope Francis used an offensive gay slur during a closed door meeting with bishops. Reports of the alleged incident first appeared on a political gossip website called Dago Spia and was later picked up by all major news outlets in Italy. The report said that during the meeting, a bishop asked the Pope what to do when gay men asked to be admitted to Catholic seminaries. The Pope reportedly said that he is against it because while it is important to embrace everyone, it was likely that a gay man could risk leading a double life. He then allegedly used a highly derogatory term in Italian to say that there are already too many gay men in seminaries. In a statement, the Vatican said the Pope never intended to offend or express himself in homophobic terms, and he extends his apologies to those who were offended. 
by the use of that term. Well, according to Italian media, several bishops uh, defend the Pope by saying that he used the term jokingly and claimed that as an Argentinian who speaks Italian as a second language, he did not fully understand how offensive that word is. But despite the justification and the Pope's apology, it is an embarrassing episode for Pope Francis, who, since he was elected in 2011, he repeatedly reached out to gay Catholics. Now, one of his first and still most famous quotes is what he said on a flight back from Brazil only weeks after he was elected. He said, when it comes to homosexuality, who am I to judge? Well, now the judgment has turned on him for having allegedly used an unforgivable gay slur. Our thanks to Claudio Lavanga for that reporting. In South Africa now, folks are getting ready to head to the polls tomorrow in what may be the country's most consequential election since the end of apartheid. That's because the ruling party is expected to get less dominant for the first time in the lives of many South Africans. Josh Letterman reports. For three decades, power in South Africa has had a three-letter name, the ANC, the African National Congress, the political party of Nelson Mandela, a symbol of liberation from white minority rule and the downfall of apartheid. For those 30 years, the ANC has won election after election after election, but this time, maybe not. A host of smaller parties is giving the ANC a run for its money in tomorrow's election. Polls show that for the first time, the ANC could fall below 50 percent, potentially signaling a new era for one of Africa's most powerful nations. All our eyes are on whether the ANC will get 50 plus one. And if they don't, um, we are then beginning to imagine what would a coalition government mean um, for South Africa. What's behind the shift? Intense dissatisfaction with how life is going in South Africa. In the first years after apartheid, many voters credited the ANC with improving conditions for the poorest South Africans. The economy became more fair, especially for blacks. People felt like things were getting better. For the last 10 to 15 years, that's plateaued. Uh, and so there has been real rise in frustration with the government. It's easy to see why. Unemployment is hovering around an astounding 32 percent, the highest in the world. An energy crisis has triggered rolling blackouts across the country. And the ANC blamed for failing to rein in corruption and runaway violent crime. And then there's the issue of race and lingering inequality. I think one important fact, we haven't really transcended, um, you know, the issue of race as a country. And uh, this continues to play itself out, especially when young people are looking at the opposition parties and positioning themselves and trying to decide in terms of which political party can actually represent their interests. And for people under age 30, they've never known any government other than the ANC. For most of us that are immune, now we've never voted before so we would like to see something happen because ever since i existed <laughs> i don't know maybe my parents i've never seen anything that is of change josh letterman is joining us now so josh what happens if the anc were to fall short of 50 percent well, it wouldn't be game over for the party necessarily, Hallie, because they are still likely to be the largest vote getter, right? They'd have what we call a plurality. And so the most likely thing that would happen next is the ANC would have to negotiate with one or more of those smaller parties to form a coalition. Now, that could significantly affect how the ANC is able to govern going forward. And it also would likely open up the floodgates to more political competition in the future, with a lot of voters saying, look, we understand the ANC has this huge legacy and history associated with liberation. But now we know that there are other parties that we can choose from as well. Now, after the voters go to the polls tomorrow, we're not expecting to get the full and final official results until Sunday. But based on the early projections that should start to come out, we will likely know which way this race is going to go within the next day or two. Allie? Josh Letterman, thank you for watching all of it. Appreciate it. NBC News covers hundreds of other international stories every day, and because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our teams around the world have done it for you. Here's a look at what they're watching in a segment we call The Global. Out of Papua New Guinea, more trouble in the region that's been rocked by a deadly landslide. A bridge used to bring help to the area collapsed. That's going to stop people from getting to safer ground, so it's a huge concern. There's a disaster team from Australia that's there using drones to help map out some of the spots most affected. An estimated 2,000 people have been buried alive, it's believed. 
Out of the Caribbean, two and a half tons of cocaine has been seized from a Venezuelan fishing boat in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. That's a lot. France's Caribbean Armed Services says they acted on a tip to make the bus. The boat, the crew, the cocaine have been handed over to Venezuelan officials. It's actually not the first time it's happened. There was another seizure of cocaine in the same area earlier this month. And out of India, at least six people have died from heat stroke in the western part of the country, where they're feeling temperatures, listen to this, as high as 118 degrees. This is a heat wave that has not broken. It hasn't been breaking, essentially, for weeks. India's summer temperatures usually peak in May, but scientists predict more warmer days than usual this year because there have been fewer thunderstorms. To a new study now out tonight showing giving kids peanuts or peanut butter or peanut products from a really young age up to the age of five could actually help prevent allergies when they get a little bit older. Researchers say if this happens, it can cut the rate of allergies in kids by about 71% by the times they're teenagers, a protection that could last for years. Now, we've seen the guidance change over the last decade or so of when to expose kids to peanuts, but this could be big news for millions of Americans. Dr. Natalie Azar is joining us now, millions of parents, of course. What's yeah. interesting here, so my daughter's four, when she was born, the guidance was give her peanut stuff, like do it at a young age. So what is so significant and different about this study now? Than what you were doing. Yeah. Yeah, well, so the guidance has shifted basically since 2017, and it's because we have had now today the third in a series of three studies that have looked at the consequences of introducing peanut before the age of five. Okay. The first study showed that it reduced the incidence of peanut allergy at age five, and then everyone stopped eating peanut, and then at age six, they found, oh my gosh, it's, it's still there. The protection is still there. You don't have to keep on consuming peanuts. This latest installment of the LEAP trial is now this protection has lasted into adolescence. And the kids who were, you know, the, the initial, these are the initial kids who were studied, which I think is great. They're still following them after all it's this amazing. time. And it's so the kids who got exposed to the early peanut before the age of five had a sustained protection against peanut allergy that has lasted through and until adolescence. And that's what's so significant about this, right, is that we're finally finding out now for the first time that, yes, if you give your kids the peanut powder or the puffs or yes. the whatever, mix the peanut butter into the yogurt, right, yes. when they're little, yes. up to the age of five, they could actually have this protection when they're teenagers. I mean, right. that's a big deal. Well, I mean, I think I, I don't remember exactly why this happened in the 90s, but it was basically in in the 90s when we just saw this you know bump in allergies everywhere and so to overcorrect for that mm. it was no peanuts until the age of two that's what it was when my kids were little so interesting you know like just the the idea that if you avoid the allergen when you're exposed to it you will suddenly be tolerant of it it actually is the like anathema of how we kind of approach uh, allergies so you know using science and understanding that if you do incrementally like that's how you know allergy desensitization works like yeah. allergy shots if you give somebody a tiny little dose of it at a very, very young age, you're, treat, you're teaching your immune system to become tolerant to it, and that's, in fact, what they have shown. So, so for the next generation of kids, Hallie, yeah. this is huge. I mean, I'm sure even with, with your child, so many peanut allergies in school, no peanut butter no, and jelly sandwiches. And, lunches, right, and that's right. just an inconvenience. But think about, like, you know, I have close friends whose kids have severe allergic Intense. anaphylactic reactions yeah. to, and, you know, the, the, the constant fear you live with. So this will be a generation-changing uh, approach, if you will. It's incredible. Dr. Natalie Azar, great to see you. you Thank too. you so much. Much more to get to here on the show, including the small town now apologizing, the theater now apologizing, after the screening of a super famous film turned super controversial with a rant from one of the movie's biggest stars. New pictures tonight from inside the room where a Q&A with an Oscar-winning actor took a, well, unexpected turn. You see Richard Dreyfus here, coming out on stage after a screening of draw Jaws. He's got a dress on over his clothes before allegedly delivering a rant described by attendees as transphobic, sexist, and homophobic. You see some of the images there. There's no video of what he actually said, but our Chloe Malas talked with somebody in the room who said they were stunned about what went down. Watch. This was intended to be a lighthearted evening about Jaws, an incredible film that so many people love. And to hear these transphobic comments, it was painful and dehumanizing. 
Chloe Malas is joining us now. So this was supposed to be a Jaws chit chat turns into this rant that the movie theater that hosted this even had to apologize for. Yeah, I mean, the theater came out and issued this lengthy apology, but I do just want to back up Richard Dreyfus taking the stage, like you said, wearing a dress, coming out to Taylor Swift's love story, but it was in a mocking fashion, sits down, and although the conversation initially was about Jaws and, you know, talking about how it came out in 1975, such a big moment in his career, it then turned turned into conversation about the Me Too movement, to which Richard Dreyfus allegedly um, called out woke culture and said it's the same people that called out individuals during the Me Too movement that also are the ones that support 10 and 11 year old children wanting to move forward with changing their ge uh, genders, um, also attacking the parents, also attacking women, criticizing Barbara Streisand um, while working on Close Encounters, saying that women should be submissive that women are meant to be passive and that m women should not have a voice. I spoke to Sarah Hogg, who you heard from just a moment ago, who was in the audience with their partner. Mm -hmm. And Sarah said that people started leaving the theater wow. in droves and that maybe the reason why there isn't actual video footage of this is that people were so disgusted that they didn't even think to take out their phone. They thought about just getting out of there. Take a listen. Many people walked out, including myself and my partner. Numerous other patrons who were at the Cabot also found it unacceptable. There were scores of people filing down the stairs and out onto the sidewalk. Wow. So I also just want to read to you a little bit about what the Cabot Theater said. This is a very well-known theater in Beverly, Massachusetts, right near Salem. And they said, we are so sorry. This was not what the conversation was meant to be about. The statement went on to say how much they regret this happening, how disappointed they are in Richard Dreyfus. But again, doesn't really go into the details of exactly what he said, but they said that they take full responsibility for the oversight and not anticipating the direction of the conversation and the discomfort it caused to so many people. I don't know how anybody could have expected that Richard Dreyfus would, Dreyfus would take such a turn, but he has said offensive things in the past. I want you to take a listen to something he said last year about the Film Academy's new inclusion rules and what he had to say on PBS. They make me vomit to be telling me as an artist that I have to give in to the latest, most current idea of what morality is. And what are we risking? Are we really risking hurting people's feelings? NBC News, we have reached out to Richard Dreyfus uh, for comments, uh, and we have not yet heard back on what happened over the weekend. Chloe Malas, thank you for your reporting on this. Appreciate it. Good to see you. We got a lot more to get to here on the show, including the biggest name in AI saying it's time to focus on safety. We'll tell you how open AI is trying to protect folks even as it gears up for AI that could be smarter than all of us. So today, you've got the developer of ChatGPT rolling out this so-called next frontier model of AI technology that could get us all a little closer to AI that's smarter than the rest of us. Might not be hard. Something called Artificial General Intelligence, AGI. And it comes when AI has obviously been front and center at this discussion of safety with the technology getting more and more advanced. Brian Chung is joining us now. What is AGI? Like, how, what should we be worried? What's up? Yeah, well, there's a lot of questions over, like, what AGI means relative to the AI. The difference is not just a G. That general implies that it's technology that can essentially do more human reasoning. So AI right now it has specific tasks, right? Tell me how many uh, legs an elephant has. Uh, help me drive my car. Uh, but AGI has the ability to maybe do complex things together, uh, walk and talk, if you will. Uh, again, not just necessarily in a, in, a, in, a, in a solid sense like that, but able to uh, put together different pieces. So this is the next frontier that open AI says their development is headed towards. They said in a cryptic uh, blog post today that we, quote, we anticipate the resulting systems to bring us to the next level of capabilities, uh, hinting that this could come sometime soon. So they're putting together a committee to try to police uh, and make sure that this next step that OpenAI might be making is going to be done in a responsible manner. Again, this is coming as they just unveiled a few weeks ago that GPT-4.0, again, most people will be familiar with that version of OpenAI as the one that had that voice similar to 
Scarlett Johansson. Again, this is the next step that they hope to make going from AI to AGI. Well, you mentioned this and we showed it up on screen, this committee to try to deal with some of these safety and security discussions and decisions around this. But, you know, worth pointing out, it's the company that's behind the technology also working to safeguard the technology. How does that compute? Yeah, there are a number of OpenAI's own members that are going to be part of this subcommittee, which is basically a broken out part of their board that's going to do a 90 day review of the potential risks and also opportunities of this jump from AI to AGI. And again, as you mentioned, there are a number of people within OpenAI that are going to be part of that, including, of course, Sam Altman, the head of OpenAI entirely. But there's also Brett Taylor, uh, who was the former CEO over at Salesforce, in addition to Nicole Seligman, who was over at Sony. Uh, but this is a, a very much in focus because the personnel behind this technology is very much in view. You had Ilya Sutzegever, who was the uh, former uh, chief technology officer of this company that recently just left. He was behind that. You remember public spat where uh, Sam Altman was actually replaced yeah. as a head of OpenAI for a brief moment. So this is very much a, an interesting musical chair situation. But again, this is the uh, part of the board that's going to be tasked with making sure that this AGI isn't technology that's going to ultimately come back to harm humanity potentially something we'll have to watch very closely uh, no no less of stakes than that brian chung thank you very much appreciate it good to see you that does it for us for this hour we've got more coverage picking up right now thanks for watching stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the nbc news app or follow us on social media